Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Wilson. Um, Mark is a, is a friend, and, and most everybody in this room probably knows him. He's a man that, that is deeply committed to public health and is engaged in more, more community organizations than I am, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, he's our, he became our health officer for Jefferson County in 2011, overseeing the various uh, programs in Jefferson County Department of Health. Before taking that position, he served on the Jefferson County Board of Health for three years and worked for over 20 years as a general internist uh, in indigent care at Cooper Green Mercy Hospital, including several years as the outpatient medical director and the chief of staff. Uh, he helps lead the County Health Action Partnership. He's also a leader in the local Pills to, to Needles uh, uh, collaboration that addresses our opioid epidemic. Uh, he's involved in just countless numbers of coalitions and organizations and efforts that are all focused on improving public health in Jefferson County. Someone who's deeply committed to this uh, effort of public health, both inside the health department and in the community. Uh, he has an engineering degree from Georgia Tech, but more importantly, his medical degree is from UNC Chapel Hill, and Mark, all I can say is go Heels. <laughs> now, for all of you people in the SEC, what that means is that Carolina, who's in the ACC, just won the national championship in basketball. It's a big deal. I know it didn't show up in the newspapers, but it's a real big deal for those of us who went to schools to play basketball. So, with that, Mark, a welcome. And Thank you, Drew. Uh, I was mostly hibernating uh, in medical school books and the hospital and stuff uh, when I was in Chapel Hill. Um, so um, I'm a little bit nervous, as most people are when you speak, but when I walked in here and smelled the swimming pool, <laughs> it, 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 it hyped it up just a little bit more because I remember back when I was a kid going to the YMCA for swimming lessons when I was not a very confident swimmer and I did not want to put my face in the water <laughs> on the deep end. Um, so hopefully I'll settle down here a little bit. I don't, I don't think I smell the chlorine right now. So um, anyway, we need to seal off the swimming pool until I finish my talk. Um, so. Um, I usually take a little bit of liberty with this talk. The state of the health address is, um, it's a little challenging, frankly, because it's, it's kind of hard for us to say, okay, how are we doing this year? Partly because data is lagging. Um, there's just a lot going on that's much more fluid. Um, it's, it's hard to encapsulate it in one year. So, um, and I'm taking a lot of liberty this year because I'm not going to try to encapsulate one year, I'm going to try to encapsulate 144 years and look into the future in less than 45 minutes. So fasten your time machine seatbelts uh, and let's see what we do. But this is our um, 100th anniversary for the Jefferson County Department of Health. So if you see any uh, health department people wish them happy anniversary, Take them out to dinner, <laughs> champagne, candlelight. Uh, we appreciate that very much. Um, but we're very, very proud of our tradition here. And I just wanted to share some of that history with you uh, for the first half of my talk. Um, one reason I am a little more nervous than usual is that it's hard to get your head around all this. So this is one of the most difficult talks I've had to prepare. And I'm not absolutely sure how it's going to go. So hopefully we'll get through this. Um, but in order to do the last 100 years of history, you really have to go back to near the beginning of Birmingham's history. Uh, Birmingham, as most of you know, was founded in 1871. And um, in the summer of 1873, uh, Birmingham was hit with a major epidemic of cholera. Uh, cholera is an extremely dangerous disease that can kill people within hours. Um, bad diarrhea, severe dehydration. Um, there was a national epidemic going on, and hence what you see here is a report that you can actually read online. It's very interesting. Uh, that was a report of the Surgeon General at that time. But basically, the population of Birmingham was about 4,000. A man traveled from Huntsville uh, with the disease, and it died in Birmingham and it quickly spread uh, person to person, partly because they didn't know what it was initially. 
Um, and then it got into the well water, which supplied a lot of the city. And so half of that population got out of town. So, and among the 2,000 left, about 150 died. Um, so pretty dramatic. Um, one of the doctors during that time was this man, Jordan Mortimer, uh, who stayed behind and cared for the sick. Uh, and he's the one that actually wrote the report to the Surgeon General recounting this. And he, he, at the end, he put it as his title, Member Jefferson County Board of Health. Uh, so there was actually, which was really the medical society, and it still is today, our medical society is essentially responsible for the governance of our health department, which I believe is a good thing. In the very last paragraph, um, he wrote a tribute. He said that justice demanded that he recognize the prostitutes in Birmingham that stayed behind and cared for the sick um, wherever they were needed without asking any thanks. And this is a very famous madam, Lou Wooster, some of you in public health circles, certainly at the School of Public Health, recognize uh, this name because there's a Lou Wooster Award uh, that was actually given yesterday to Joyce Vance, our former U.S. attorney, who uh, took the lead on addressing our opioid epidemic. But sort of a colorful history, um, different shades, um, but sort of an interesting history. This man, um, another doctor, uh, James Lucky, he was actually the last recorded uh, case of cholera during that epidemic. He, he actually was taking care of the sick and got sick himself. And then the previous doctor, uh, Dr. Mortimer, took care of him. Um, and he was lucky indeed. He survived. And he actually became the first of a series of health officers starting in 1880. Um, that was uh, assigned to cover basically Jefferson County and the city of Birmingham. That's the first time that had actually happened. Previously, just different towns might hire a part-time doctor to help keep up with some records or investigate epidemics, things like that. So from 1880 um, to 1917 um, was a pretty rough time for Birmingham. Um, there were lots and lots of disease epidemics. Uh, we did have part-time health officers. We had, um, in, I think, in 1890, um, the city hired a couple of sanitation inspectors, one for the north side, one for the south side. But um, there were just all sorts of disease outbreaks. There were um, outbreaks of typhoid, uh, smallpox, malaria, um, at one point, uh, TCI, the big steel company, iron uh, mining company, had 8,000 employees with malaria. Uh, and they had to bring in an expert named Lloyd Nolan, who had had experience in Panama, to get that under control. And he, and he actually did, got that number down to about 30-something. Um, other epidemics, things, uh, tuberculosis was one of the top causes of death during that time. Scarlet fever, hookworm. The list went on and on. And there was an epidemic about every year or two, and there were other things that were just endemic. Uh, infant mortality was very high. Deaths from accidents were extremely high, basically, you know, the mining industry, the steel industry, the railroads. And um, sometime during there, Birmingham was the murder capital of the United States. Towards the end of that time, um, 1915 to 1917, there was um, another typhoid epidemic. Um, and a lot of children were also dying of diarrheal illness, a very high infant mortality rate uh, from children getting diarrhea. And it was during that time, in response to that, that the Medical Society decided to start an official county health department. And they appointed as their first health officer this guy, Judson Dowling, MD, um, young family man. And uh, that typhoid epidemic was, uh, there's some debate about it initially, but it was initially, eventually confirmed that it was related to the milk supply. Uh, a lot of raw milk being sold by multiple dairy farmers 
and uh, they pretty much proved that, as well as uh, the calls of a lot of children getting diarrhea and dying um, from some of the milk. Some of that was typhoid, some of that was other things. Um, so Dr. Dowling and the Board of Health um, actually convinced the city to pass some new regulations in 1920, um, requiring that the bacterial count in all milk that was sold be below a certain level, that uh, all the dairies be inspected and pass an inspection in order to legally sell milk. Well, that didn't go over too well. Um, in 1922, uh, Dr. Dowling uh, was up late at night. Kids were tucked in. He was up reading. There was a knock at the door. Um, some, some men were there saying there's been an accident. Somebody's been hit by a car. He's in the back seat of our car. Can you come help? Came out, looked into the car, and got a blow to the back of his head with a pistol. And he was thrown in the car, driven out of town, uh, taken out in the woods, and flogged. And told not to tell anybody. And he was told to leave town within 30 days. That if he did, did tell somebody what happened, they would kill him. I don't know what kind of courage you all have, but this man had the courage to actually put a call the newspaper and give his account of this a few days later. And that's what you see here. You'll also see here that the uh, very, in that very bottom corner on the right, the Board of Health said, we support our health officer. Um, and um, it turns out that the whole town supported their health officer and the health department because kids weren't sick anymore. Uh, milk sales were actually doubled. The typhoid epidemic was brought under control. And Dr. Dowling was actually given sort of a Citizens of the Year award by the newspaper following year. So one big problem in Birmingham was um, sanitation, especially sewage. At one point um, in, uh, I think it was in about 1930, it was reported that in spite of Birmingham having instituted a sewer system fairly early on for the main center city, there were about 8,000 houses that didn't have indoor plumbing and they were using outdoor privies basically. Um, this was an ongoing problem through the next few decades um, to the point where um, eventually the health department set up the very first in the state laws requiring that all homes have their own sewage system or septic system or be hooked up to the um, municipal sewer system. Um, the health department very early on started doing food inspections for places that prepared food for public consumption. Um, kept up with that in spite of the population growth pretty well uh, until the depression hit. And when the depression hit in the 1930s, revenue went way down. And so the health department actually had to stop doing food inspections during much of that decade. And here's a particular famous event that's also in the newspaper. Uh, actually, this is a uh, journal article. Uh, there was an outbreak of foodborne illness at uh, Inslee High School, most of the high school students, where about 122 students got sick, several were hospitalized. Turns out it was from cream puffs from a nearby bakery that had this terrible sanitation. Um, the cream puffs part sounds good, though, doesn't it, from those of you that remember public school or, um, but anyway, um, that was a sort of a big event that got everybody's attention again and got food inspections back going, but it actually turned out it wasn't until after World War II that they were able to get up to full speed and, and maintain that, um, partly because of the depression and then partly because of lack of work, workforce because of the war. Rabies. In the 1930s, around 1934, um, Birmingham was known as the rabies capital of the United States. Uh, we have just, all, we're famous for all sorts of things um, in, in Birmingham. Um, so during that year, 1934, in the first month of that year, there were 41 animals that were tested positive for rabies, which is a lot. And within the first half of that year, over 800 people had to be inoculated 
for rabies uh, that had animal bites. Um, so the health department really moved into high gear over the next several years, instituting um, animal control, requiring that all animals be licensed and inoculated. This had to be done via ordinances with cities. And they actually took over the dog pounds for the city of Birmingham and negotiated uh, impounding animals for other municipalities and eventually the whole county. We don't do that anymore um, directly because it's pretty well being taken care of by municipalities. But that was a really big problem then. Uh, if you don't know it, if you get rabies and you don't get the shots early, it is 100% fatal. Um, so the last reported death from rabies in Jefferson County was in 1959. And in 1963, the number of animals down in the county that had rabies uh, was zero. It's an amazing accomplishment. I'm fast forwarding pretty quick, uh, just to hit some highlights. This might be a familiar picture. Uh, this is looking down, I think that's uh, Temple Emanuel there, and looking over the city. Um, early 1970s, Birmingham had a major air pollution problem. The health department had started monitoring the air some in the 1960s using some grant money, but this was before the EPA and before the Clean Air Act, which was actually formed and passed in 1970. So the big landmark event in the November of 1971, when we had a thermal inversion in Birmingham, where the air just hung at the ground, and there were a lot of heavy industries going full tilt at that time. Um, the air got so dirty that it was really toxic. People were getting sick. It was getting, it just kept going up and up and up. They tried voluntary, the health department and others tried to get voluntary reductions in uh, output by the local industry, mostly steel mills. Uh, there was a little bit of compliance, but not enough. And eventually, the health department and the EPA and the Justice Department had to force all the, about 23 major industries to totally shut down for several days until the air cleared. That was the first time an action like that had been done uh, using the Clean Air Act, EPA, um, in the United States. And we're very proud. Birmingham is still, you know, it gets ranked as usually top 20, top 25 air pollution of major metropolitan areas in um, the country. But relative to what it was, the air is much cleaner. And since 2013, we have been in attainment with EPA clean air standards. So a lot of progress has been made there. Um, during the 1970s, there was a big expansion in primary care and health services, a lot of building of health departments, um, I mean health clinics around the county, um, and moving into more clinical care in addition to traditional public health that I've talked about already. Part of this was due uh, to a really a game-changing legislation in the 1970s that earmarked some of your sales tax and some of your ad valorem tax for the health department. Um, and it comes directly to, from the Treasury to our health department and our Board of Health is the board that controls those funds. That really sets us apart from other counties in Alabama, makes us stronger, um, sets us apart, frankly, from a lot of health departments in the country. Um, and more about that later, but that was really, really crucial and helped us to do a lot of things we weren't able to do before. And I have to mention this guy, Guy M. Tate. He, during that 1970s period, we had two health officers with a lot going on, including that air pollution crisis, that were basically fresh out of school. I mean, they're really young guys um, who didn't have much experience, certainly smart. But this guy was deputy health officer. He was a non-physician, and he was very politically astute, and basically, I think, helped navigate a lot of these crises at the time and helped navigate getting that legislation passed that helps make us the strong health department we are today. And I'll also mention this just because, as I reflect on the past, um, it's real obvious how we stand on the shoulders of a lot of other people that went before us. Uh, I've talked to some of the previous health officers and they said the same thing. Uh, people like me are sort of up front, the guy in charge 
heavily depend on other folks to prop us up and get the work done. And in fact, I have two deputy health officers in the room right now, Dr. Dobbs, Dr. Hicks. I'm extremely grateful for them. I would frankly be lost without them. So um, fast forward to um, about 10 years ago, um, another paradigm shift and frankly something that was made possible again from some of this previous work. Um, looking beyond the walls of the health department in order to get public health work done. So one of the key things that happened was in 2005, 2006, the planning of a community-wide strategic plan for, for health and a community-wide health assessment. Um, that's the one on the left, Roadmap to Health. Um, and then we did another one just a couple of years ago. But this became a strategic plan for the whole community, all of us starting to partner together. How do we do public health for all of those that are involved in anything that impacts health, which, was almost, which is almost everything. Another key thing that happened um, as part of this new paradigm of public health outside of our walls uh, in 2006, the Board of Health passed a resolution that set up the Public Health Advice Fund, which we are continuing to run in partnership with Community Foundation, where money, again, made possible from tax revenue from our citizens, from you all, um, was set aside. And frankly, a lot of very careful financial management that allowed the health department to save some money. We were able to now grant money to organizations within the community to build public health capacity in the community. Very proud of this, it's very innovative. Um, it is um, also quite fun. It's really fun to be able to help others do well and, and give away a little money to help the cause more broadly. And then soon after that, and part of, uh, I think was spurred in part by this community planning process, the Health Action Partnership was formed. Um, many of you in this room know this history better than I do because you, you have lived this. And I wasn't here until five years ago. Some of the things that came out of that, uh, Drew mentioned all the grant money that was obtained that would not have been possible without, um, without that funding. Uh, child care regulations passed in 2011. Um, that's in the legislature right now to try to get that statewide, but we're way ahead of the curve on that. The Red Rock Ridge and Valley System master plan designed out of grant money that came through our partnership. Um, comprehensive smoke free ordinances. Uh, Birmingham was a really big one, but we've had other, several other cities pass uh, ordinances as well. And then uh, most recently, um, we're very proud that our health department became accredited with the relatively new Public Health Accreditation Board, first health department in Alabama and one of the top 100 out of about 3,000 health departments in the country to be fully accredited. Um, this accreditation process is a lot of work, but it helps assure that we are maintaining high quality, doing the things that are nationally accepted to be standards for good health departments uh, and what they ought to be doing in the community. Okay. That's the first half, that's the history. I left out a lot, but that's just hit some of the highlights. Um, if any of you are hist history buffs, we may commission you to help us write a book. I think it would be nice to have a 100 year history uh, published at some point. So um, now I wanna talk a little bit about where we are now and our, our strategic plan going forward. Um, we just finished doing a new strategic plan it's a very exciting time for us because we're going to be able to really sort of expand out what we're doing. Um, here's just four areas that we're focusing on. Scope of services, where we're um, going to be getting into some new areas of service to the community, things we haven't been doing before or things we're going to do more of. Uh, really focusing on our county customer relationship. Um, there have been complaints that our health department hasn't been as visible as it used to be out in the community, in the neighborhoods. Uh, a lot of people are unaware of our services, so we're going to really work hard on making people more aware of that. We do have a new website 
uh, new social media platforms as part of that, but there'll be much more. Focusing on our culture and our people, making sure we're investing in our own employees, making sure they're the best they can be, and also giving our employees the technology, the tools they need, and using technology to make what we do much more efficient. Here is a summary of our strategic plan. It's on our website. Don't panic. I'm not going to go through every little bit of this. Um, but it is there for you to see. And this is only an outline. Each, each, of these, um, each of these little paragraphs or statements you see has about five or six things under it um, that have detailed tactics. I am going to focus on this first section on your left, that scope of services, because I think that's where most of you might be interested um, in potentially be partnering with us. And I will also say um, that the very first part of this is focusing on data. Our whole strategic plan was had a lot of inputs. One was that community health assessment and strategic planning process I mentioned before, the community matters. Many of you participated in that and gave us input. Um, also, those public health accreditation standards were input. And then the data that we have accessible to us day in, day out, um, we use that to sort of decide what our priorities need to be and where we want to focus our services uh, and expand services. So we've already used a lot of data. We will continue to do that to measure what we do and make sure we're on track. So one area is going to be to focus on um, chronic disease prevention. Uh, these are the areas that look very familiar to you who have been working with us in the Health Action Partnership. Uh, stuff we've been working on before, obesity, um, diabetes, pre-diabetes, which is largely related to obesity. Uh, hypertension, tobacco use. Hypertension is probably a little bit more new for us in terms of focusing on that. That's a little bit more clinical care but we realize there's just a lot of mortality, morbidity based on uncontrolled hypertension, especially in our African American community. Um, we think there's a lot of room for improvement there. There'll be more about that um, when I talk later. Um, let me mention too, I, I need to back up just a little bit. We had a lot of discussion, as we have here at the Health Action Partnership, about health equity. And we thought about putting health equity as one of our specific priorities. Um, that Community Matters 2020, that community health assessment that we did, what rose to the top out of that whole assessment we did countywide was health equity. Top priority. But as we discussed our strategic plan, we said, no, we don't want it as one sort of silo item. We want it to be cross-cutting through everything that we do at the health department. So it's not explicitly stated, uh, but we are planning to have some visioning uh, type meetings with our employees and some training around health equity. Um, and you'll see health equity in what the rest of my, my presentation is. And it is actually here because we have a lot of disparities in this area. And one thing we're hoping to do is use data and technology to focus more geographically uh, or among populations where we have hot spots rather than spreading it all around the whole county and being less effective. Another area we want to focus on is um, in the area of infectious disease prevention and management. And some things that rose to the top here are these three, HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis C. Uh, we are seeing a lot of racial disparities in HIV and syphilis, uh, as well as gender um, disparities, um, men who have sex with men, difficult population for us to effectively reach. So there are a lot of challenges there and numbers that are frankly um, unacceptable. Um, and then hepatitis C, which we have not really been involved in very much, but very concerning, and I'll show you some data in just a second. So here's just some data from this past year on um, HIV, sexually transmitted diseases. I'm not going to go through all of this, but the numbers are pretty high, and you'll see that there's a, a disturbing trend, uh, increasing problems 
Um, a lot of theories about why that's happening, but um, clearly a challenge for us. And in the middle of the slide there, you'll see congenital syphilis. Um, this is very concerning. We've had more syphilis cases in the uh, female heterosexual population recently. And when that happens, as you can expect, you can have babies that are infected in the womb and born with congenital syphilis, which um, about 50% of them are either stillborn or die very quickly. Those that survive can be severely uh, debilitated. Neurologic problems, uh, vision hearing problems. And we had three cases this last year. That's the first time since 2011. So that's another reason why we really want to focus on that. I don't really think we have all the answers, but we're determined to collaborate as much as we can with partners, including uh, experts at UAB um, and uh, others to help us get a handle on that. Hepatitis C um, is, I guess I would call it a silent epidemic. Our friends at UAB Emergency Department, Jim Galbraith, has taken a real interest in this, and they got some funding to do a screening of baby boomers, universal screening of baby boomers to come to the emergency room for hepatitis C, which is in keeping with CDC recommendations. Um, and they found a fair amount among that population. Um, but then they decided to go ahead and do the younger population, those born since 1965. And that's a key number because the, the baby boomers presumably got hepatitis C mostly from blood transfusions a long time ago. Uh, the younger population was after the blood supply started being screened for hepatitis C. So we see numbers here, and, and there's, just look at that highlighted part in the middle. Um, <coughs> basically, you'll see a big uptick in um, hepatitis C among the white population that comes to that emergency room. This isn't necessarily countywide data, um, but it basically is corresponding at least about 90% with injection drug use. Um, and it mirrors, the numbers here mirror sort of what the population is doing. A smaller percentage of minority population using needles compared to whites. Uh, but regardless of race, we have an epidemic, and hepatitis C is a very expensive disease to treat. We are going to begin screening and treating hepatitis C at our health department. We've already begun through our primary care, but we're going to have a special clinic just for that as part of our disease control clinics. Mental health um, has always been a big issue, unmet need in our, in need in our county. Um, so we're committed to uh, seeking to integrate more mental health services into our primary care services. That's going to be challenging, I'll be honest with you, we haven't got very far with that yet. Um, most of our focus has been right now on substance abuse because of the opioid crisis. So I'm just going to give you a couple trends here. Uh, this got our attention a few years ago, again, thanks to Joyce Vance. Uh, in, late 2013 that we were seeing a lot of heroin overdose deaths. And here's the trend. We really started working on this in 2014 as a community-wide effort. Um, this looks like maybe things are getting a little better. Less heroin deaths. But, as many of you have heard in the news, fentanyl has gotten into that injection drug supply. It is 50 times as strong as heroin. Uh, very deadly. And so now the fentanyl is shot way up. We had a total of 248 overdose deaths this past year. Um, a lot of that's been heroin and fentanyl. Not all, but a lot of it has been. So things are not getting better yet. They're actually still getting worse despite our efforts. So we're doing a lot of work in this currently and uh, should be seeing some things happen pretty soon. The health department, um, recently agreed to take over the support of the Pills and Needles Community Partnership, community-wide collaboration, sort of like a health action partnership for um, the opioid crisis. Um, we're going to expand the distribution of naloxone. We're currently offering naloxone the antidote for free uh, in, through our clinics. We want to be able to do more outreach with that to get it out where it's needed. We plan to, with partners, develop a resource recovery center if somebody needs help with addiction, 
right now they, they have to call all over the place, look for things on the internet. It, you can call all day and not get anywhere, and when you do get somewhere, it might not be the most appropriate for you. So we're going to be setting up an actual place you can go and see an actual person who can give you the information you need and do a, an official mental health approved substance use assessment um, and then help refer you to the appropriate place <coughs> and help navigate you to that. <coughs> and we hope actually also hook you up with peer navigators, uh, people who have who are in recovery that can kind of go alongside those who are in the middle of, of addiction and help them get to recovery and help support them in the process. Um, this is something I think we may actually open within a year. We want to expand access to medication-assisted treatment, um, medications that assist people in recovery from opioid addiction, the most evidence-based and effective mode of treatment, uh, and make sure that that is included for low-income and uninsured people. Our vision is for anybody in Jefferson County to be able to get help today and get into treatment. Uh, and then continue our work in education, policy, and advocacy. Uh, we did a lot of work to get that naloxone bill passed um, a couple of years ago so people could carry naloxone, lay persons could have it to assist someone in an overdose. Right now we're hoping to pass needle exchange legislation. Uh, There's a bill introduced earlier this week. Um, getting back to those hepatitis C numbers and the HIV, uh, we're very worried about dirty needles that are out there um, and the possibility of an HIV outbreak related to needle use. And that's happened in other parts of the country. Um, keeps me up at night. Uh, needle exchange might be counterintuitive to some people uh, that isn't that helping heroin addicts use heroin. No evidence for that. And in fact, it's a way to engage people and help them get into treatment. And the legislation proposed requires that they get referred to treatment, that they get naloxone training, that they get screened for diseases and have other services. So it's an effective tool for public health. This is just a picture of the naloxone kit or uh, opioid rescue kit that we're giving out to people that need it. If any of you know somebody that needs it, let us know. There's information on our website. We're using the nasal spray currently, which we think is the most convenient. Another objective is to improve birth outcomes and foster intimate, uh, <coughs> optimal infant health um, and development. The infant mortality rate has been a big problem for a long time. Uh, here are the numbers. Jefferson County, a couple years ago, uh, where it sacks up compared to Alabama and the United States. These are not good numbers. Um, and then here's some trends uh, based on race. Um, I hope you can interpret this, but basically three-year trends. Each box is three years, and then each set of boxes is different races. So overall, then white population, and then non-white. And so you can see there's a lot of racial disparity here. Um, we are unfortunately seeing some gradual improvement among the non-white population. But uh, this is an area where we're really going to be ramping up our efforts and uh, increasing capacity within the community, again, not just the health department, but working with others uh, to address this. Um, one reason our strategic plan lists improve birth outcomes and optimize in, uh, birth outcomes and help children get off to a better start, I'm paraphrasing, um, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to put infant mortality numbers out there and say we're going to lower those numbers. It's, it's very hard to do, especially year to year the way data works. But if you focus on lowering infant mortality and engage pregnant women <coughs> to help them have better prenatal care and engage new moms, especially low-income moms or uh, single moms or teenage moms, in helping them take good care of their baby, and get their child off to a good start, be a good parent, it has all sorts of other benefits, even if you don't get that infant mortality right now. So that's one reason I'm convinced this is a very important high priority for us. 
I'll also say, I think, is there's a lot of good work going on in this area already. Some of you in this room are involved in that work. So kudos to all of you that are focusing on this. But I still see this sort of as a gap. We're focusing a lot as a community on college readiness, high school graduation, getting the homicide rate down, getting the incarceration rate down, helping kids be ready for school, helping kids read on time, helping people get jobs, expanding 4K, a lot of great stuff. But I think that where we need to really put our focus going forward and all hands on deck is that prenatal to age three area. And if we can do that and have a vision for 20 years from now, a lot of these other things will fall into line and we'll stop putting out fires so much. Hope you've heard about the baby box. Uh, we were very lucky in Alabama. We were talking about this in Jefferson County. How can we do the baby box? Uh, everybody know what the baby box is? Finland did this years ago and got their information all the way down. It's about safe sleep, basically. You're given a box with supplies, it has a little mattress in it. But the main thing is that in order to get a box and you get it for free, is you have to do education on safe sleep and how to take care of your child and keep your child safe. Um, anyway, we were talking about this and then all of a sudden some great entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs came along and said, we want to bring this to Alabama. It's already been paid for um, statewide, unveiled just a couple weeks ago. So we're helping to support this in Jefferson County. We also helped develop some of the educational materials for it. Um, this is hey, a big Mark, one that's in our strategic plan. If somebody wants more info on the baby box, how do we, what's the best go to for that? You can actually just look it up online, babybox.com okay. or right. baby box company, and you can sign up online. Thank you. But we'll be doing outreach in prenatal clinics and other hospitals are all signed up already. Okay. So it's, it's going to go. There are already about 3,000 people signed up in Alabama yeah. within a week. Um, we are going to help establish a nurse family partnership. Um, this is a nurse visiting program where um, high risk first time moms are given a nurse, uh, bachelor trained nurse RN, usually with experience in um, obstetric care, starting by week 26 of pregnancy and following with frequent visits and education and support through age two of the child. This is a national program that's in Montgomery and Tuscaloosa that has not been in Birmingham. Highly effective, very strong research and evidence base. They help uh, reduce infant mortality. They help children be ready for school. All those things I mentioned earlier, those downstream effects, they actually have data for a lot of those that show that this is effective. Um, we are not going to provide this self ourselves, but the health department is committed to providing ongoing funding to hire the first four nurses and help get this started. And we think this will start in our community within the next year. Finally, um, and kudos to our people in environment, mental health, Barbara Newman, uh, who has been very passionate about this, we're going to uh, commit to um, doing formal health impact assessments. Again, this is familiar territory to a lot of us at Health Action Partnership where we're talking about uh, the built environment, <coughs> systems, transportation, things like that. Um, but there have not been enough formal assessments done to help lawmakers or decision makers locally when they're thinking about a project or an initiative to do a formalized evidence-based study on what the impact of that will be whether positive or negative on health. So our health department is committed to doing some of those. I think I made it. 144 years, a little bit of the future. Um, we do have a new website. Uh, please check it out. It still has a few little holes and kinks in it. Um, but uh, we are really, we put a lot into this to make sure that people can find out about our services, navigate things better. We're on uh, Facebook, Twitter. Anybody who you are tweeting, please tweet today, get on board. Um, but this is just one part of us uh, reaching out, making ourselves more visible. We're going to have more events throughout the year uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary. 
So thank you for your attention. Uh, I might just go jump in the pool now and take a swim. <laughs>